All right, good evening. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. And for those of you on Zoom, this is the first time we've done this live and uh, on YouTube, I guess, this time. Uh, in COVID, we did the State of the School on Zoom. So uh, thank you for tuning in for what I am thinking of as a morning meeting for adults about the things happening in the school. So if you ever wonder what morning meeting feels like, it will feel a lot like this, and it will probably have a lot of bad jokes in it, because that's also what my morning meetings tend to do. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, this quote, which is from uh, an Andrew Marvell, who's a 16th, 17th century poet, uh, to his coy mistress, and he's talking about how uh, they don't have time for their relationship, we're running out of time, um, we don't have world enough, we have had we but world enough in time, and it's an odd thing how time moves during the school year, because Every day is still 24 hours, but there are some that feel very fast and some that feel very slow. And February is kind of the slowest month of the school year for us because we finished January term, we've started second semester. Um, admissions has kind of happened, we've issued contracts. Like it is a slower, if there is a thing, time. And then all of a sudden March hits and it's like the year's over and it's gone. So I definitely hit that on Wednesday. Um, and now we're kind of moving through it. Um, but time has been a theme on my mind this year in general. We started with our summer reading book, uh, John Green's Anthropocene Reviewed, in which he tells a bunch of little review stories about everything from like Diet Dr. Pepper to lawns to the bubonic plague, things that have happened during the Anthropocene, which is this concept of a geological epoch centered around like man, humankind's dominance on the earth. Um, and that's kind of a big thing to think about, like we are at this age, like the age of the dinosaurs or the age of man. Um, 
it's big, it's huge, but we're still in this day-to-day -day life moving together. Um, so I've been thinking about time, time movements in the school, um, and kind of the timeline of our experience over the last few years. So I'm going to give you what I think are the epochs or the periods of time that we have gone through in the last three years. And because this is in the style of a morning meeting and because it's me, this is an elaborate video game metaphor. Um, so we're gonna start with, uh, I've been thinking about school in four chunks. The first chunk is the before times. This is everything that happened at university in its first 20 years, so pre-2020. Um, we were an innovative startup. We were designed to put students at the center of learning. We uh, saw some rapid growth, some steady growth periods. Um, we really solidified these values that our founding board and trustees came up with. You know, it's one thing to say, we're gonna design a school that's committed to diversity, committed to personal responsibility, but then what is it like when you put 100 students or 200 students or 350 students in a room and then see how they actually live that? So we were still in those early stages solidifying what those values meant. But we provided an, education, an excellent educational experience, and by the time we got to 2020, we were preparing for our first leadership transition when the founding head of school, Chuck Webster, retire, retired. I like to think of the before times as our Super Mario Brothers era. <laughs> All right, so we were having a good time. We, Mario, in advertisements, is always smiling. His brother Luigi is there. His friends are there. He has to defeat Bowser, but you're going to move. You're going to get some coins. You're going to like find the star, and it's going to be a pleasant game. Then we hit COVID. And I like to think of COVID as a much different video game. It's also a current HBO series. Um, the mushrooms we were eating in Super Mario Brothers to grow big and strong have now mutated and they're trying to kill us. Uh, so The Last of Us, if you don't know, is a post-apocalyptic game. Um, but it does make me think about what we had to do in that time. There was rapid change. There was tremendous uncertainty. We were kind of figuring everything out as we went. Adaptability was the constant but we still had those values at our core. Those were the things that guided us and helped us make, uh, make our way through. If you've not played this video game, it is the best video game I've ever played, so I'm putting that plug in here too. Um, we exited uh, COVID in uh, our Minecraft or rebuilding phase. So we had to go to school online, we changed the schedule, we changed how we thought of assignments, we changed how we thought of turning things in, um, and then we had to figure out what to carry forward. How are we reinventing things? What from this rapid period of disruption do we want to move into the regular day? And now we're arriving, oh, I forgot I put this slide in. If you attended the state of the school last year, I talked about this rebuilding phase and I talked about how one of the things that came out of it um, as a leadership group and as a board is that we came up with five thoughts for the future of University High School. These are not necessarily radical new thoughts. These were true of the school in its inception but these are the things that we most care about and we most believe. We believe that we are about people first, we believe that relationships drive learning, we believe that deeper learning comes from a relationship-centered culture that is built on student wellness and all of the various uh, components thereof. We want to be the best stewards of our resources and we want to keep being trailbla trailblazers, we want to keep innovating. So these were the, go the core concepts coming out of our rebuild phase. Um, and now we're in the new normal, um, and I'm thinking of the new normal uh, is Zelda Breath of the Wild because that is a massive open world game. If you want to start the first minute of the game, you can take on like the final bad guy. You will lose, but you can do it. So we are, we are in a state of uh, open exploration, of curiosity. Those values are still core, but we are centralizing our vision now post-COVID. And um, this is right timed for us as an institution because our board is getting ready to draft its next strategic plan. So this is the phase we're in. We've gotten through the hard times, or at least through the hard times for now, and we're ready to keep moving forward. I hope that metaphor makes some amount of sense. So like any good video game, the first thing uh, we need to think about when we set out is like, what is our terrain? What's the map? What gear do I have? So I'm gonna go over just a few facts and figures about where the school is this year, what we're looking at for next year, and then I wanna deep dive into two topics. Um, first off, about enrollment. 
We grew steadily over the time, and I carried this out through 2027, because I know we have some new parents who are joining us tonight. I, will, I am also a new parent, because my daughter will enroll here next year, and I'm very excited about that, and she is the class of 2027. Um, but we will be at about 350 students for the foreseeable future. That is in part because our facilities limit us. So we can't grow much bigger without adding additional rooms onto Fairbanks Hall, building another building, expanding this uh, facility, and we're not quite there yet. So if you're wondering, how big is the school going to be while my current child is here, it's about 350. If you have a three-year-old, we could talk later about where we might be when that three-year-old gets here. Uh, but right now it'll be 350, which means the class sizes um, in terms of grade levels and in terms of the student experience in the classroom are going to be about what they are this year. Um, we do have 94 current freshmen, so they will roll forward as kind of a larger class in the low, low 90s. Um, as sophomores, we're projecting 80 to 85 freshmen, about 85 plus juniors and seniors. That does mean core classes average 18 to 20. Some electives are smaller, some electives like band or orchestra are much larger. Um, teacher loads will be about that 75 uh, to 85 students that they teach. That's really core of the university experience because we want the teachers to be able to interact with the students um, on a level that provides a lot of feedback. Our diversity demographics are remaining pretty constant, so we're typically between uh, 30 and 35 percent students of color, so about one third, um, and we're about a third uh, students on need-based financial aid. So that won't be changing in the, in the, near, in the near term. Uh, financially, uh, our financial picture is quite strong. I wanted to just show briefly, we, did, we are seeing right now, as everyone is, expenses outpacing revenue a little bit, uh, just because of inflation. Uh, as many of you read, um, we did have to do a, a, we've always tried to tie our tuition increases to inflation, which means that this year, for next year's tuition, tuition increase was a little tip higher than it has been typical in the last few years. Um, that's largely because of increased infrastructure costs. It takes a lot of electricity to run a school, and our electric bill is up 28%. It might be up 28% in your homes, um, but trying to manage those costs while retaining um, faculty and staff. You'll see our largest expense by far are salaries and benefits. That is our investment in people. We're investing in the adults who come together every day to help uh, deliver the program of the school. Um, the other thing that I think is important to think about is like how we're judging our efficacy. So this very complicated graph is uh, a course evaluation tool that we started using. It was developed by the Wellington School, which is a 6 through 12 school in Columbus, Ohio, progressive school. They're a little older than us and a little bigger than us. But they started with a question of everyone does course evaluations. What makes a good, honest, easy for a student to understand course evaluation that they will actually think about and will make sense to them? And they decided you can ask students if they enjoy the class and you can ask them if it challenges them. But asking them much beyond that, particularly freshmen, eighth graders, sixth graders, uh, you're not getting useful feedback. So for every class, we started using this tool in 2017, every student since 2017 has put a dot on this chart. Um, the per class, one dot per class. The uh, x-axis measures their enjoyment, so they call this the love it scale. So if you went all the way uh, stage left, if you went all the way that way, you really loved the class. If you went all the way the other way, uh, you did not like it. And the y-axis does challenge, so the higher up at the top you are, the more challenged, and the lower to the bottom, uh, the uh, least challenge you're feeling. And the Wellington School says engagement, and I fundamentally agree with this, is the addition of enjoyment plus challenge. A kid is gonna be engaged if they find your class to be something they like and they feel they're challenged. Um, they name the other quadrants as well, so if you are um, enjoying the class but not challenged, that's great, you're entertained. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, so I think about my own educational career. I probably would have put, and I loved band, all of my dots in entertained. Because I was a trumpet player, I took private lessons, I did solo work, I played in a jazz band downtown. Like, I got my musical challenge elsewhere, and being in band was just not as challenging as the rest. I'm sorry, Daniel Knox is running all my technology, and I do not mean to be insulting band classes. All right, <laughs> but I would have been in entertained. 
Um, similarly, the, the upper quadrant over there where you are challenged but don't like it, that to me was every PE class. That was the grind, right? Like, I, I, this is pushing me, and I do not like that it is pushing me. Um, and then the bottom corner quadrant, which is our least populous quadrant, and it, by record numbers, is what they call the boredom quadrant. You're not being challenged and you don't like it, so you're just checking out. We ha do not have many dots in that quadrant, and in fact, when we started using this tool, we were an early adopter, so I was uh, dialoguing with the people at Wellington a lot, um, and there were two times where they actually thought we had done something wrong or broke the software. The first was when we did it and we had less than 4% of our dots in the boredom categories. Like, they're like, every other school has at least 10% there. And I was like, well, I don't know what to tell you. I don't think we broke it. Uh, um, and we've stayed, we've stayed low. So this is all time users. This is from this August on. And you'll see we're still following the same pattern. That blue diamond is the average. We're still highly engaged. We do have some students who drop all of their dots in the furthest corner. Um, so we have that polarity, but we're, we're, we're not really bored. We're a little entertained. We're a little grind. Uh, we can frame it this way, too. The software is a tremendous amount of graphs. Pre-COVID, we were about 68% engaged. And post-COVID, we're finding we're a little low. Um, and what, what has happened is the students are rating their challenge to be less. I don't know if that means the challenge really is less, because this is all student perception, but they're perceiving there to be less challenge. So we're having some interesting dialogue as a faculty about why that might be, what we could do to account for it, are we comfortable with that. Um, but we've typically been in the high 60s of engagement and then 4% or little less in, uh, in terms of boredom. Um, this, like I said, many graphs. Uh, can anyone guess what the giant spikes are? It's January term, right? So every time we do this, we do this twice a semester and we do it in January term. And every time we get to January term, this is the second time they called me to say, you must be lying and broke it. No, like, <laughs> uh, they, kids really enjoy their January term. So you can see all the way down on the far side, October of 2017, Notice here, when we get to 2020, the fall of 2020 and into the spring of 2020, that challenge goes down. Um, we did have January term in May in 2021, so, but the dot kind of got absorbed with the evaluation of the rest of the classes, so it doesn't pull it out um, separately. But then when we moved it back, returning to normal, um, it continues to go up. So we've got some work to do at analyzing that challenge. Um, we're not quite sure yet what's happening. Uh, but we, we are talking about that as a faculty. Overall, though, enrollment is promising. Our financial picture is promising. The school, the way the school, the students see the academic program is promising. And our achievement continues to be um, quite noticeable. Uh, we are th three years, Dr. Vesper, undefeated as the academic team in the White River Academic League. Is that true? Regular season, um, we just won the uh, we just won their tournament that they haven't had in three years. We are competing at the state level um, on Saturday, next Saturday. Uh, we always qualify people for DECA, which is a business association competition. Last year we had 15 qualifiers. This year we have 32. We have a national merit finalist. Um, our students are showing their creativity through ISMA solo and ensemble contest. Uh, the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards is a big deal. It's the longest running uh, honor for creative arts students. There's video and sculpture and photography and essay writing and playwriting and poetry. Um, students honored there. Um, and then athletically, uh, you know, continue to excel in a number of sports. Our girls basketball team was sectional championship. Peyton C there is, was a PAC conference player of the year. We won the pack in both boys and girls. The boys are in the middle of their sectional ru run. They won on Tuesday, and they play again tomorrow night. Uh, and if they win, they'll play in the championship on Saturday. So overall, if we're reading the map of where we are, we're in a pretty good place. Um, so then, if we're setting off on our video game journey, we have our quest. And the quest at university is pretty simple. It's our mission. Our goal is to expand the hearts and minds of our students through academic, creative, and physical achievement. And there are two aspects of that that we're really focusing on right now that I want to talk about tonight. Um, the first is that 
heart and mind, educational philosophy and practice. So one of those things coming out of COVID that we've really thought about, what do we want to do? What matters? How do we want to communicate it? How do we want learning to happen? Um, is uh, our approach to teaching in the classroom. So we started uh, kind of a five-year process of educational redesign in 2021 coming out of COVID. You know, teaching online forced us to rethink everything. So we reread everything any committee at university has ever articulated about what our academic program is. We read several books on uh, deeper learning and learning in schools and what is the future of education. Um, and we had a committee do a deep dive and then some larger faculty discussions and we created what we're calling our eight essential elements of teaching and learning. The goal is over the course of the next year, we will develop plans to embed these eight elements in all of our academic practice. And then we will kind of move faculty through cohorts to onboard that. Because it takes a long time to design a course and then a long time to redesign it. So we've got our North Star, but it's gonna take us a little bit before we get everything set up uh, to do it. And then we'll build it into our hiring and evaluation uh, schemes as well. Um, the elements are kind of in three, I think of in three groups. There's eight of them, eight doesn't divide by three. I don't teach math, um, but, <laughs> but, but I think of the first two as really who do we see ourselves as and how do we see ourselves as teachers and students in the classroom? So this idea of what does it really mean to be partners in a learning community? What does it mean to see yourself if you are the student as a participant in a course of study? We want to be able to practice those things in our classroom and make sure our students understand that this is what we're committed to. The second set is really on kind of how we teach and present material. And this is, if you think about education in kind of the old school industrial Horace Mann model, industrialized education existed to prepare students for a workforce that doesn't happen anymore, right? It was predominantly maybe more physical labor, some management, um, all, even if you think beyond that to kind of classical Greek education, a lot of things uh, a lot of the educational principles were someone has the knowledge and they have to disseminate the knowledge and then your job is to keep the knowledge. Well, we all carry the knowledge around in our pocket right now, so education has to become something different. So are we moving beyond just base knowledge, beyond that kind of I'm the sage on the stage and I'm going to say things and you're going to write them down and spit them back on the test, to analysis, synthesis, synthesis evaluation, creation. And then when we get to students demonstrating their learning, are we asking them to demonstrate that they understand things in multiple modalities, in different ways? Um, you all work in professional fields and you might repair, prepare some standard reports, but you have to be able to produce in different mediums, right? There, you know, one is like, well, now I'm going to work today and every Friday I'm gonna have my multiple choice quiz over the tasks I did the previous week. We, that, is, that is not uh, a, a model of the real world, so we wanna, we wanna be able to prepare students for that, and we want to build in a component of reflection and self-evaluation. Do they know how they're learning? Are they ready to self-assess? Um, are they ready to say, here's what's working for me, here's what's not working for me? That's the number one kind of academic resilience skill that students need when they go to college. Can I assess where I am and what I need? Because right now they've got teachers that are up on them all the time, proximate to them. They're living at home, other people are doing that, and when they go off to college, they have to do all of that on their own. So we want to instill that, that part, um, that process in them. And I think these eight things are important to education, but I think they're also super important when we think about technological innovations and the way our world changes and things like chat GPT. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, so I'm gonna do a brief overview. A couple of people in the room are nodding. Um, chat GPT is kind of like a Google search as a chat bot. Um, it came out in late 2022. It's by a company called OpenAI. And you can, as it says over there, ask it anything. Can you explain to me quantum computing? Can you give me ideas for a 10-year-old's birthday party? And it will scour the internet know what it knows, and make you a response, a unique response. Um, so I'm gonna do a little live demonstration if you've not seen this and if all of the technology in the room works. So 
So Daniel's going to switch it over. Um, you do have to make an account. But I teach English, right? So one of the first things I asked it, being an English teacher, is um, write an essay on the poetry of Anne Sexton. Oh, uh oh. It might be because my computer went to sleep. Hold, please. That's exactly what it is. I got kicked out. And, and I t I've, I've asked th this question many times. This is a new answer. So it's not searchable. Like the question of what is plagiarism is interesting. Um, and it'll go through, and I will say, uh, it's learning every day. This is a better essay because it didn't compare to Sylvia Plath the previous three times, and that is a true <laughs> comparison that it can draw. Um, and it, it reads and it's fine and it is a little bit of a stock answer. You know, it starts with a broad thesis. It, uh, every, every time I ask it to write an essay on a humanities topic, the last paragraph always begins in conclusion. Uh, um, but, but it will do this. If I ask it, so I do uh, um, something a little more specific. So, and I'm gonna see if it got smarter on me on this one. Analyze the imagery in what the Living Do by Marie Howe. So Anne Sexton, if you don't know, is a pretty famous American poet, writes in this confessional style. Uh, Marie Howe uh, is a contemporary poet, so she's still alive, she's still writing, she's a little bit less known. There hasn't been scholarship on her because she like, hasn't finished her career. Um, and the last time I asked it this question, it started to uh, write the same type of thing. Um, oh, it is getting better. Because when I asked it this about a week ago, it was quoting things in kind of the same style, right? One of the most striking images. It's very declarative, right? Um, oh, well, now it's doing it in the second paragraph. Sitting alone beside the window, wrapped in a shawl, staring at nothing is not a line in this poem. Like, it's not always right. It can get a big topic, mostly correct, kind of like Wikipedia, but if you want it to get granular, um, it can be off. And this can create a lot of misinformation. Um, and a lot of misleading things. Uh, so we've been talking as a faculty about what do you do when this happens? And there's a lot of schools of thoughts, a lot of higher ed people are talking about this. You know, do you start to build, and people already have, the bot that catches if you used AI? Do you try and like flag it? Do you, do you, are you trying to hunt everyone out? Or are you ignoring that it, the problem even exists? We've talked as a faculty, and we don't think that's the right answer. We're never going to outsmart them, the students, or the AI, in some ways. Um, in fact, Dr. Vesper took a number of writing samples by our faculty and ran it through chatbot detectors. And it turns out some of our most beloved faculty may be computers. 75% uh, <laughs> likelihood that everything Jamie McDougall has written was generated by a chatbot. Um, Tom Fitzgibbon, shockingly, clear. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we, we can't bury our head in the sand of this, but what we have to do is think about this as a tool. This is great, and I've talked with kids about it in terms of, man, I have to write a paper on the Great Gatsby. I could ask it, give me three thesis statements on the Great Gatsby. And it would generate them, and then I could think about, okay, what do I believe is true? What do I not believe is true? Um, Chris Bradley is dealing with this in, in history class, and he said, you know, he's going to do a, an exercise where you know, he has a typical essay that the kids write. You want to write the essay on your own? Great. You're going to sign a paper that says, I promise I'm not using chat GPT. I'm, this is my own words, my own thoughts. But he's going to give them the option, why don't you use this tool? Ask it to write the essay. And then what you will actually generate is an evaluation of the essay it creates. And that's a really interesting skill because that's teaching students what I think is most critical right now, which is how do I understand 
the messages that I'm receiving and what something, not even some person, is telling me is the truth. So we really are leaning into this. And that's what some of these, educate, these essential elements ask us to do, right? Don't just spit back an answer. If I was the type of teacher that just did three papers a year and they were very broad and one of them was right on Ann Sexton, someone could turn that paper in every time and, and I wouldn't know the difference. But if I actually ask them to engage, that's when we get to true deeper learning. Um, it does a whole bunch of other things too. Uh, if you haven't played around with this, I guarantee it will start showing up in your workplaces. Uh, we had a faculty member who said, you know, here's my current job, write me a cover letter for the next job. And it wrote it. And it made up statistics, like, uh, it, as in my time as communications coordinator, website traffic has increased five and a half percent. And I went to, it's Nyla Neely, who's now going to be our director of communications, and I said, has website crest, like, traffic really increased five and a half percent? No! Like, I mean, it might have, but we, did, we didn't know. Um, it just made it up. Uh, I was at a, a book club with some medical professionals, one of whom wa runs a residency program, and she was talking to me, she's like, you mean my residents could write their personal statement using this? Absolutely. I could tell it to give me a lesson plan on Act 2 of Hamlet and it would write it. I tried to outsmart it being creative and I was like, okay, sometimes I write plays. Write me a dramatic scene between two characters. It spit the thing out, stage directions, character descriptions, the whole thing. So this is a future tool that we have to figure out how to learn with. Um, and that's why we have to kind of re-articulate what that vision is um, and what we think education should be. Daniel, can you go back to my slide deck? Thank you. Um, and one of the things we do when we create these environments where kids are willing to try and test and engage um, is be really conscious of the community that we're creating. We have to develop a space where students feel like they can be vulnerable when they can say, here's this thing, how do I deal with this? That's when real um, instruction happens, that's when real learning can move forward. Um, and that's why the second thing I want to dive into is wellness. Because in order to be vulnerable, you have to feel safe, you have to feel seen, you have to feel cared for, you have to feel valued. Those are all aspects of wellness. So we began this year um, with a new position. Many of you know Ladea Conde is our director of wellness. We are trying to get a post-COVID baseline on mental health and wellness in the school. Just about every school in the nation is doing this right now. Um, so we looked around, I uh, talked with some people through the National Association of Independent Schools, and we took, in November, you might remember, if you are a current parent, uh, the High Achieving Schools Survey, which is a uh, vetted survey, psychologically researched, of values, value, uh, I'm gonna, blanking on the name, verified questions um, by a group called Authentic Connections. Uh, they work with 212 schools, grades six through 12, public and private, it's about 83,000 students who have taken this post-COVID, so our data is nationally normed. Um, we took it in November. We offered the ability to opt out if the student or the parent was like, I don't wanna tell you about wellness. They could, but we had 96% of our students take it. Um, and the major aims were for us to get a sense of our well-being, for us to understand where our strengths are, and then what I loved about this program compared to everything else on the market was they give you uh, scores and indicators of this thing, this issue, is the issue most tied to the wellness of your school. So this is what you should work on um, if you're going to improve, and the very actionable items. So what did we find? We found out that we are actually really well as a school. We're about 10% better, uh, higher than the average indexed score of wellness. Um, we are below average in the indicators of, that's my word, it's very scientific, unwell symptoms. So symptoms of a school that is not well, high anxiety, high depression, high what they call rule breaking, so that's dishonesty, sneaking out, substance abuse. We are below average, below the national average and the, the norms in all of those categories. And we had high markers of faculty and staff support. So I put this word cloud out and it's, these are the words that people said were our strengths and I still quite can't wrap my head around it because it seems like racism, discrimination and divisiveness could not be a strength but it's like how they categorized it, like we are good 
at managing that. Um, so it was an inverted thing to me in my mind. But you can see there, faculty emotional support and faculty academic support. Over and over again in the free response questions, the students talked about, I know the adults here care about me. And it's, often it's their mentor, but if it's not their mentor, I know there's someone in the school that I can go to if I'm having trouble with anything, with my homework, with uh, how to make friends, with what do I do to, I don't know, run a faster 100-yard dash. They don't even do yards anymore, right? No, meters? Is it meters? I'm real bad at sports. 100-meter um, dash. I know that I can go to someone who's going to help me through that problem. Um, they also identified, I think, really concrete growth areas for us. So things that we could do to help increase our wellness. We could talk more often about mental health. And we actually have already started this. This is an initiative that Lede is doing with the students. She does a mindful minute every Monday. She talks about processing stress. Here are some techniques you can do. Just talk more about mental health resources that are out there. Um, we can spend more time helping students understand how they're using social media and relying on it as a comparative tool, and what that basically means is the peer pressure of social media. Am I using Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, whatever they're using that I don't even know the name of yet, um, to tell myself what I should look like, think like, do, be like? Um, and it isn't that the survey asked, students, do you think you are using social media in this way? Um, the questions that they ask lead to the conclusion that it might be social media that is driving them uh, to, think, to think about themselves differently, to have concerns about where they fit in. Um, we could do more with helping students respond to inappropriate social behaviors. So does the student in the moment know what to do when something is happening? Um, there were some things in transparency, like the school overall could do better, like the adults too, in intervening in this. But the driver was really, do the students know what to do when this is happening and, and how to think about it? And then we could do some work on parent education. The student assessment of some of what makes them anxious is my parents talk to me about my grades too much, and I do not have the independence that I want. Now again, I have an eighth grade daughter who will be here next year, and I'm sure she would tell you ask her about her grades too much, and I don't give her enough independence. Um, so working with parents on how that may be perceived, how you might have those conversations, because we know as parents we have to have those conversations sometimes, in a way that helps the students feel supported. Um, we have a committee, a wellness committee that Lede chairs. She works closely with assistant head of school, Stacey Summit Mann. They are going to continue to do deep dives into the wellness material, into the data, into the stuff in the survey. We will take the survey again next November, right? So it's repeatable that we can judge our progress. We can continue. Um, our index score right now is an 88. Uh, it's not like get to 100 and that's perfect, but we would like to see growth. Could we get to a 90? Could we continue to go um, in that way? Those are the two big things before us, and I think they're very critical for young people at the time. Um, we want them to learn the world is getting more and more complex, and the best way for them to learn is feel socially and emotionally cared for in the building. So that's kind of the heart and mind education of university. While I have you as a captive audience for a few more moments, let's talk the rest of the year. Um, there are a number of things happening. If you don't get the blazer blast and you're standing in this room with me, you should talk to Ashley Crockett Lore about why you're not getting the blazer blast. Um, all of these things will be in there, but we now are in March. Time keeps on slipping into the future. Um, boys basketball sectionals is happening. We do have coming up a parent education opportunity next Tuesday at March. Uh, we will have a facilitated conversation. Uh, with our faculty here uh, after viewing an Isaac's parenting series on um, technology and mental health. Uh, our dance marathon is raising money. If you want to see the teachers of university embarrass themselves on this very stage, it will be next Friday, March 10th. Um, music concerts will be happening later in March. Our parents association will host their January term preview night if you haven't been here before. It's a casual evening, pizza, drinks. We talk about J term courses for next year before we even tell the kids about them. Um, and then we roll into April. Spring break is the April 2nd through the 9th. Um, 
Grandparents' Day happens in late April. A new student registration, so if any prospective parents here or online, will be happening April 25th and 26th. Uh, the musical goes on at the end of April. Um, there's one more open house, and then graduation is Saturday, June 3rd. So it is a quick clip. I didn't even put on all the baseball games, the track meets. We're doing indoor track meets now. There's one Saturday. Yeah, there's one Saturday. Um, life keeps moving here, um, and it's amazing to watch. We had a shutdown where we didn't get to do a lot, and now we're back open, and it feels really, really good, and I'm excited for what's ahead. So thank you guys for coming tonight. Thank you people for being online. Um, if there are any questions, anyone here can talk to me afterwards. We've got things in a chat, or you can always email me at university. If you have a question and you watch this online, that's fine too. So thanks, everybody. Have a good night.